I, I love Aldi's cookies. I don't know if they have it over there uh, in the UK, but Aldi got like two cookies and they don't even like try to market them. They're like dark and bright and like hell, you know, so it's... Uh, <laughs> they just call it like hell cookie. It's bright, bright cookie. I have no idea what's in it, but it's so good. <laughs> Seriously, I want to be sponsored. I will chug this down <laughs> like the i will do i will do the you know the, the thing that every youtuber guy does and you know i just want to talk to you a little bit about aldi cookies <laughs> just a second of your time link in the description below check them oh. out i'll do that i'll do that for an aldi cookies sponsor. can you make sure can you make sure you clip this bit so this is the trailer the <laughs> <laughs> Aldi hell cookies. With... <laughs> they put the hell in. <laughs> we are going for this. This is going to be the campaign for the podcast now. Hey everyone, it's Larissa Sleeper here again, together with Ash Gray, and welcome back to the Venom Prison podcast. This is episode number five. Joining us today will be the artist Eleran Cantor. We've worked with him before. This is the fourth time that we worked with him on an artwork for Venom Prison for our upcoming album Erebus. It's up for pre-order right now, so go and check it out. It'll be out on 4th of February 2022. We will be discussing obviously the artwork and some other cool things and Eleran is a really interesting guest to have and super cool to talk to so enjoy this is Eleran oh there's a countdown oh look at that it's now recording after we've spoken about Mario Kart teaching no it's just some chit chat (laughs) I've spent like my best material (laughs) my my notes are gone this is all down here from here. This is literally the podcast now, explaining what we've explained. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, how's the record going? All sealed, all done? Turned in? Kind of. It's, it's uh, mixing and mastering as we speak. Um, oh, oh, so you weren't done with mixing and mastering when we were... No, because the there was delays on the delivery time of when it could be done. So it yeah. was it was basically when we were aiming for it was gonna be when we were like now ish, is that right? I think so. But with the artwork, um so in order for Century Media to submit it for um pressing, they need the artwork first for whatever reason. So the the print files have already been submitted and that's to basically reserve the spot yeah or the pressing or something like that i don't know apparently it takes up to nine months at the moment to to press vinyl okay so so submitted all the files have you seen have you found all the little tiny penises that i drew inside yes 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 okay if you (laughs) manage to find them all and delete them i left them i left them (laughs) i think people will that's usually what (laughs) it's the it's the easter egg (laughs) <laughs> yeah, they is is the <laughs> <laughs> But no, it yeah. it's kind of so yeah, we we finished recording uh June, is that right? June we finished recording. I it's been so, so honestly yeah. it's been so long. Like I think we started in December last year. Um and we've only just finished it now. Uh, just gone in June. Uh so it's it's oh, we, so, we, it's, so better be oh, good. I I oh. hope people like this because <laughs> we've put so much into it, haven't we? It's it's gone that extra mile. It you can really like even when I listen to like the monitor mixes of the songs, like you can you can hear it's really gone that extra mile. Like it's it, it's mm-hmm. something that it's something that I'll be happy to be proud of. You know, no matter how well it does. 
I get fans all the time. I mean, fans of you guys asking me, so how's the new record? And I'm like, I'm the, I'm the last guy to hear it. <laughs> Because the conversation is always sort of like this. It's like first day of talking about concept. It's like, and we'll send you some pre-production demos. And I'm like, all right. And then nothing happens. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> it's the, yeah. time to, to wrap time, it up. This time we didn't even send you pre-production because nothing. it kind it kind of sounded shit because I had to put the vocals on myself. And I'm really, really bad with mixing. So mostly it was just like vocals and nothing else. And it was like really hurting in people's Oh ears, my God. So. Can I, am I allowed to explain oh. how it was? Pretty yeah. much, here's a pre-production. I put vocals on it. So the whole music's behind it at literally zero dB. And the vocals are at like 5,000 dB. <laughs> and all you can do is just screaming for four minutes. And I'm just like... You you can't send these like this. It's not going to make sense. But I don't know. Maybe maybe a cappella metal is the next big thing. You guys will go on tour with what was that band? Van Canto. Were they an a cappella band? Was an a, a, yeah, they they just don't have guitars and drums. They do it all with a cappella. Pretty impressive. That's an angle. Yeah, just. I'll talk to your manager afterwards because you guys are just behind on marketing. Do you know what, Lewis? We're going to have to dig those pre-productions up. They're going to have to go on the vinyl. (laughs) (laughs) No, but seriously, never be, I mean, um, so self-aware when sending me stuff because I listen, I mean, most of the stuff I listen to is, you know, program drums, MIDI drums, even sometimes I... I hear it like entire records done in like guitar pop. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the guitars as well. Everything's MIDI. So yeah, I'm, I, I've developed this um, sort of, uh, I can imagine what's the end result going to be like based on very raw, very raw demos. So next time, next album. Okay, yeah, yeah. Well, maybe, maybe I could send you, because we have some files. I have some files without the bass on it. We can send that to you if you want. Ba- bass is not important. <laughs> not the bass is not Yeah, no, bass is not <laughs> Yeah, we should. We can send them over. That's no problem. Yeah. All right. Looking forward to it. I mean, in what does it differ from the uh, previous material? Um, it's a lot more ambitious is that the right way to say it all right like good. you love you love your, your own music don't you ash I, like full, I, full, full I know it. well i gotta be haven't i because yeah. if i can't it's like when we do pre-production it's like if you can't believe that it's good yourself how can you expect someone else to have faith in it like yeah like, sure. it's the same with with art i guess like if you don't like yeah, it, it is. How can you expect your customer or client to like yeah. it? That's that's why even uh, I mean even before we begin working on uh, on sketches and everything, I you know I I walk around my apartment like a lunatic in circles for a few weeks thinking about like the perfect composition, the perfect concept. I mean that's where that's the crucial part of uh, of the work process for me because if i don't see uh, in in my mind the um, the end result that's something that really excites me and really something that i would be interested in seeing that i truly feel like i mean bands entrust me with something that's ve- very dear to them and they want something that's gonna be not only represent their music, but also give them something unique and give them uh, like more of an original face, something that will be memorable, something that will last uh, for a long time. So that's that, that builds up a certain pressure to come up with something good. And, you know, and it gets harder and harder each time you do it, because that's when you do an album cover, that's one new idea that you can't use in the future. So it just gets, I mean, pressure goes up. I mean, probably the same with songs. Yeah, definitely. It it does, doesn't it? It's kind of like we always said we never wanted to do the same album twice. And it was it was like doing this record was, you know, it's it's the big, the big number three record. So like it just felt right to kind of just try and be a bit ambitious and, you know, try and just you know, kind of push something that was going to kind of 
make sure that it was the band's natural progression, but just to a whole new level with something that's had more time and attention and like just really refined. It feels really refined. Does that make sense? I guess so. I mean, if I think about the, your last single, that was also um, yeah, yeah, an evolution of your song. Yeah. And that's yeah, and that's exactly what we've done with this album. Is kind of not use that song as you know the blueprint, but kind of saying like, look, we are going to start thinking about these song structures. We are going to start thinking about you know making a song memorable rather than how many notes can we play in four minutes and how heavy is something like we've just kind of thought these need to just be good songs all right yeah. so, i mean when do you when do you think it's going up oh, sorry that's all right you go until after the <laughs> when do you think it's going to be out I, I really don't know at the moment i'm it's next year definitely I, yeah i don't think it'll be this year just yeah. based based on the fact that it takes so long to to actually press the the vinyls at the moment, um, but yeah, right. I don't think cool. nobody is listening to the vinyls. People just buy them to put them on the wall. So seriously, in order to cut down on time, just print <laughs> just blank vinyls with all, no sound should, on them. Should we just do a big announcement after this? We should suggest. Should we do an yeah. announcement after this? Hi guys, I know you all want to listen to the new record. Don't worry about buying any vinyls. It's online. Here you go. No, no, no. Buy it. Buy the vinyls. Put it on the wall, just like you always do. Just don't try playing. Yeah. <laughs> you want you want it tomorrow. Or you want it in like one year, so you can play it on your <laughs> on your turntable twice. Yeah, literally, just give them J- just just for the Instagram. Just give, <laughs> <laughs> just give them a piece of the plastic. <laughs> well, was my collection some somewhere around here? I, I don't have a turntable. I just have like tons of vinyls because of the. Um, because of the I vinyl. I kind of gave up on my vinyls not so long ago, a couple of years back, where you know I had a nice collection and stuff, and it was just it just sat on the shelf. It just wasn't doing anything. It was just so. The label is gonna delete this video. For That's sure. what we're aiming for. <laughs> we're aiming for controversy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but um, just... no, that's that's the Cartman method. Don't don't buy the record. Don't don't. Do it. <laughs> <When we> re- <laughs> not allowed. Nobody release this record. Do not buy it. <laughs> Limited to none. <laughs> Special <laughs> edition zero. <laughs> exactly. I think we're on to something special though. <laughs> I don't think anyone's done that before, so. All credit well, to I mean, there was the Wu Tang album, which only had like one copy. Was it only one copy? I think That's so. That's pretty cool. We should just and that fa- farmer bro bro bought it. So we should the farmer. The farmer bro. <laughs> oh. Oh, the farmer bro. <laughs> yeah. We should just do. I it think, sounds. I think so. Go. I was gonna say it sounds like prosthetic released the, <laughs> the record. <laughs> oh, I tell you what, we are mate. Now we're gonna get banned oh, by two. A, we haven't records. even been on the podcast for less than twelve minutes, and we've shot f- at every possible label so far. Oh, and it, but it's good that you weren't recording earlier when we were talking about China. <laughs> For the re- no, for the record, everybody's watching. We were, I'm just talking about uh, playing Mario Kart with my son and not plugging in uh, his controller. <laughs> We've cleared that up. For, the, for child services and the police. <laughs> we uh, watched our Venom Prison podcast and we've got a few questions. <laughs> They're just knocking. <laughs> oh, um, oh. Gonna, be a, gonna be a good one. But yeah, I mean... I I see I've seen I uh, know it wasn't you guys. I, do you already make like tour plans for next year? Uh, festivals mainly. Um, festivals. We've got yeah. one set for October that so far is going ahead. We haven't heard anything other than that, have we? Um, In the UK, uh, and it's and Europe as well, but we haven't heard anything back yet. It's oh, okay. we. It's a tour that was supposed to happen last year that we moved to this year, and 
I think it's quite likely that the UK dates are going to happen, but I'm not sure about Europe yet because not it's not as open as the UK is going to be. Because here on the 19th of July, um, everything's going to be back to normal pretty much, and mm, shows nice. are allowed, and you don't need to social distance and stuff like that. And you guys went to what was it to download, right? I didn't. I, I went to download, yeah. How was it? It was so weird, just like walking in. It was smaller than usual. It was only 10,000 people instead of 100 because it was like a... Like a good festival. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was basically for the government, for like a study. So, uh, yeah, I walked in. There were so many people everywhere and it just felt so strange because I've not been around more than probably three, four people like in the last one and a half years. And um, it took me getting used to, to be honest, but just being able to feel live music, like not just hear it, but like feeling it, feeling yeah. the bass, the guitars, like on your chest and stuff like that. That felt so good. Even the if smell it, of like, urine around the fences. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> The, the beautiful uh, toilets at the, at the festival. Oh, they're so nice. I, I, my favorite. That's my favorite thing. <laughs> that's that's always my favorite. It's always great, isn't it? You go into the toilet and then you just go and like go to the burger van or something. And it's just like, oh, what is that? Festival life is. It's, 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 an, <laughs> it's, been it's an acquired taste, isn't it? For sure. I mean, last time I was, I was at a festival, it was Wacken when I had my exhibition. And I think I saw maybe like 5% of the entire festival. It was just so huge. It was just so overwhelming. It's crazy. I mean, I, when I went there for the first time, I was 17. So I was like, I, I was on my feet like 24, hour, um, 24 hours a day. Just I've, I've been everywhere. But nowadays it's just gets hard <laughs> gets hard with it. but uh, i think blood bloodstock is going on i mean without any capacity limits mm -hmm. right as far as i know mm -hmm. that's gonna be cool is, is that that's a is good that one. right Lewis? i believe so yeah because uh like i said it's in august and in like a week or two there's not going to be any limitations for c capacities for festivals and shows so i believe it's gonna go ahead i hope so because i mean it's family run and it's a good family they deserve yeah, it I, I, yeah. Good i got a lot of time I mean, good people stop like when we did that um slot when was it 2017 yeah yeah that that was that's where i met that you was know. really good really really enjoyed that like it was a good day as well it was a good set for us and a good day overall really enjoyed it yeah it was good i saw it i was uh Next to the stage, but uh, it was main stage noon, right? Yeah. That was yeah. a good that was a great time to play as well because it was like still, you know, it was like afternoon, but you still had a bit of that morning freshness. Afternoon, yeah. You know, like where it just gets like twelve, and you got that morning freshness, and you walk on, and it's like, oh, this actually feels really nice. <laughs> I enjoyed the breeze more than playing. <laughs> I mean, I, I really like the people over there. This is my first time in the Midlands and everybody was so nice. Everybody was cool. I, I like Bloodstock as well. It's really good. Do you remember, because I think we played the day that uh, Megadeth was headlining, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember backstage when Dave had a full toilet for himself? Oh, the private toilet. Yeah. yeah, they basically locked locked the women's toilet just so he can use it. Uh, I mean, this video is going to end all about it. Yeah, it's so good. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Not, oh. I don't know. Uh, um, yeah, I, I remember there were, I mean, their backstage area was fenced. But, you know, uh, but I mean, I, I totally get it because when you're the headliner, and you share a backstage area with uh, tons of people. Some of them are just playing there in the morning. Some of them are like rabid fans. I mean, they play in yeah, bands, yeah, but they all want to take, a, I mean, a chunk of your time and chit-chat a bit. And some of these bands 
they they don't have a lot of time to come set up do the show and move on and it's about you know being efficient so i get it so next exhibition i'm gonna have my own toilet (laughs) (laughs) i'm gonna ask the bloodstock people to now that i know that you can put it on the rider. My rider is going to expand. That, that's where we've been going wrong, really, isn't it? We haven't been putting toilets yeah, yeah. on the riders. I think next time you will find out that your uh, caravan has been converted to my toilet. <laughs> yeah. Imagine that. Just get to it and I'm like, what's happened to this? It's just a toilet now. <laughs> no, you'll find all your, like, stuff on your refrigerator. I'll just throw down on the grass. <laughs> <laughs> you just said it's it's a wonderful breeze outside. So oh, you know, it was. You it was such to, a good breeze. I'll, yeah. You will ju- you will have to uh, eat your words and enjoy <laughs> the breeze. Yeah. You you said that you're gonna. You're Who gonna else played that day? Can't Arch remember. Enemy. Arch enemy. Yeah. Uh, Skin dread. Who else? Skin dread did. I feel bad. I haven't seen anything. Who else played? I think Annihilator played. Yeah. I, I just watched like a couple of shows. I think I can't remember who played. I know Cradle of Filth didn't play that day. Just Danny Filth was there. Great. You were you were definitely also a little bit tipsy. I remember you coming over to to Probably. our trailer with with a beer. <laughs> <laughs> gonna, gonna lose my child custody after this video and going down the drain. Oh no, nah, it was it was a great day though. It was a really good day. But... I was actually trying to find like normal beer over there. Everything was li- like um uh, what was it? Like uh craft IPAs. Nothing tasted like beer. I remember at some point I was like, do you have something that tastes like normal beer? Yeah, I know what you mean. Like it's Ben's Ben's a big fan of craft beer, isn't he? Like, it all tastes yeah. like perfume and flowers. I don't know much about it. Like, people are like, <laughs> so people weird. are so into it, though, aren't they? Like, they know so much about. Like, I, I, I'm not very good with that stuff, but like, it's amazing when they're just looking at like these labels and they just know something about this drink. And I'm like, the only thing I can identify is a bottle of water or Coca Cola. Like, I wouldn't know what an IPA tastes like if I read the tin. But like, I don't yeah, drink, me, me so neither. I have no idea. How but like, there's people is. who are like proper into it, and they can just. It's like even when they like see an ingredient that's slightly different, they're like, "Oh, I've got to try that." <laughs> it's like no, the moment they. As well. mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess you can become an expert on anything if you do it long enough, and then you can identify like tiny, small differences between stuff. It is. It is in there. You know, coffee. If if it's bitter and brown, I'll I'll drink it. That's it. <laughs> when it comes to coffee, I'm just yeah. It's it's a utilitarian thing for me. I just need to be ready for podcast. <laughs> That's it. I don't know if the camera can get it, but it is like prime instant coffee. Instant. From, from instant co- probably supermarket brand <laughs> <laughs> like the white label well, stuff is it a, do you shop at Reve? yeah now that I'm a little bit more yuppie <laughs> I'm, I'm, I don't know if you remember Berlin right but I moved to Prenzlauer Berg and now I shop at Reve used to be a li- used to be a little guy no more. <laughs> Little is too far away. <laughs> Go to, going to weather. <laughs> the upgrade. <laughs> yeah, you, you gotta make do. You gotta I've, make do. The only good thing you're gonna get out of this video is some sponsorship. <laughs> from German supermarket. <laughs> <laughs> you get. But yeah, I, I, I shop wherever it's uh, closer. To yeah, us. I'm, I'm the same. Aldi. I'm, but I'm Aldi over here. I love Aldi's cookies. I don't know if they have it over there uh, in the UK, but Aldi got like two cookies and they don't even like try to market them. They're like dark and bright and like hell, you know, so it's, uh, <laughs> they just call it like hell cookie. It's bright, bright cookie. I have no idea what's in it, but it's so good. <laughs> Seriously, I want to be sponsored. I will 
chug this down <laughs> like the I will do I will do the you know the the thing that every YouTuber guy does. And you know, I just want to talk to you a little bit about Aldi cookies. <laughs> just a second of your time. Link in the description below. Check them oh. out. I'll do that. Can... I'll do that for an Aldi cookies sponsor. Can you make sure can you make sure you clip this bit so this is the trailer? The... <laughs> 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 Aldi hell cookies. With... <laughs> they put the hell in. <laughs> we are going for this. This is going to be the campaign for the podcast now. I mean, you could be the big gulp of cookies. Do you know the big gulp guy on YouTube? No. Okay, I thought about uh, the big gulp in general. What's the big gulp guy? Yeah. <laughs> so he is a he is a big guy, and he just checks down uh, massive amounts of drinks, oh. and he does it in seconds. And he will, so people can basically vote what kind of drink he's gonna drink that <laughs> that video, and he just. Goes it's so it. insane when you explain that out loud. <laughs> This is this is this guy's concept. He drinks drinks, and you can ask him what drink to drink. Yeah. Well, he drank some sriracha sauce oh. the, uh, once as well. That that was an interesting one. I think there were so many new uh, job descriptions that were born born in twenty twenty. Yes. Especially when it comes to uh, YouTube personalities. It's blown up. Yeah, it's I, I, I think, I, I think, uh, getting to meet your spouse's parents in 2021 is gonna be way more awkward. So, so what are you doing for a living? Well, I've got this YouTube channel. <laughs> I'm chugging down some cookies. <laughs> People all over the world pay me for OnlyFans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I've I've never thought even about going down that route because it's so weird for me. I can't I can't do the link in the description thing. I can't I can't pull it off without like the coffee coming out of my nose. <laughs> I, I won't do it with a straight face. <laughs> and that could be your thing, though. You just can't you just can't take it seriously. Could be, but then it's like you're you're one of those guys as well. That's like, yeah, no, now because I have to pay the bills, I'm gonna plug Raid Shadow Legends, whatever it is. <laughs> uh, yeah, just to be, to keep cool and everything. No, that's. That. I mean, whatever a your a personality is now, because there's like tons of them up online. You just realize that uh, we are all just copies of five thousand other people around the world. Or well, not unique in any way. No. This has been a depressing well. realization too. Yeah, that's quite strange as well because everyone is so obsessed with identifying with something at the moment. People want to be something. People want to be unique, but it's a it's not possible. Might B, be just be yourself. Why do you need to identify with? I don't know as cat lover like why is that your thing yeah because we need a selling angle what do you mean we need i mean <laughs> what's gonna be the title of this video even we need the, we need an angle um L luckily for me I, i've got a dog over here so yeah <laughs> i already is that, is that, already is that took dog? care of it yeah yeah that's her that's snorkel when she was a puppy so yeah, I'm, as you can as that? you can see, I've decorated, especially uh, for podcasts. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, this wall is a, a replacement to having a real personality. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got my name over there, some artwork, and my dog. Everybody will know what my angle is. So what does he do? That's what they're gonna. You've... Petting my dog, painting stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, when, oh my God. when the album well, when the album cover is gonna be out of that, are you sure that that's the guy who did it <laughs> oh they know they'll know they know they'll yeah. know but... oh my god i actually had an account on instagram message me uh it's a fake account it it follows like six thousand people and 
it it change keeps changing the name. It has zero followers, and it keeps asking me like, Larissa, when are you going to reveal the artwork oh, yeah. you present? And uh, it just pretends to be uh, a magazine, which it isn't. And then it, they messaged me again after we finished recording. Larissa, when we can, can when can we hear your new music? It's so okay, I thought different. it was only about the album cover. <laughs> I thought they only bug you about the album cover. Also about the that they messaged me after you posted that you're working on the new cover. They messaged me straight away. It's amazing that people are just so so enthusiastic about it because I, yeah, I remember I got some questions from your fans as well that were like, okay, we sent this question to, to the band and I haven't heard from them back. And I'm like, when did you send it to them? They're like, today. We haven't heard back if you're doing the artwork. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> I think, yeah, but people are so excited. I think that's, that's you know, something we always forget about as well, isn't it? Like, we're always quick to forget that we do these albums and we get so you know, tied down with it and so, you know, caught up in it that you do forget that people are actually excited. Yeah, for sure. It is a, it's a good compliment as well, isn't it? You know, like... I I actually use it, I mean, whenever I see somebody, like, taking uh, an online dump on my artwork, I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember. I used to also uh, go online, like, this new album sucks. Yeah. I was like, okay, <laughs> I totally get the urge. I totally get the um, the feeling of it. If I if it wasn't good for business, if it, and if I had some time, I would probably do some shit posting today as well. But no, <laughs> <laughs> no. But I totally get the shit posting. So yeah, realizing that we were in this position and we could have been in this position in any way, and probably with our favorite bands, we are still in this position. Whenever uh, our favorite bands are coming up with a new al- a new album, amongst ourselves, when the internet is not watching, we're like, "This sucks." <laughs> yeah, <For sure>. absolutely. <laughs> I mean, the Venom Prison uh, group chat is like we constantly just like if a band that we've been into for a long time releases something, we straight away are like, "Have you heard?" And yeah, it's amazing. Oh yeah, it's absolutely shit. And it's like. I mean, amazing how much is, is it shitty? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, because I mean, if it doesn't get uh, any extreme emotions out of you, then you know that's how you know it's one of the more important things. Yeah, and like I said earlier, it's like you release it knowing that you believe it's good. You believe you're happy with this thing, and it it should come to the point where your mind is so encased with the idea that you're proud of it and you're happy that these comments don't really make a difference whatsoever. And like, I think the people that it does bother clearly have some form of insecurity of what they've created. Yeah. And, but you also can look at it as like, okay, this is just a, some free critique. I can use it. I mean, especially when you're just starting up, Mm. I remember some of my very early, Artwork was more in like in the vein of uh, Travis Smith, and I remember there was a guy on Blabbermouth who commented on like maybe my second or third album cover, and he was like, "These Photoshop album covers are ruining metal," and I I can still remember it. It's amazing. So whoever you are, some guy on Blabbermouth, you you changed some stuff <laughs> afterwards. I, I didn't want my artwork to ruin metal. <laughs> Oh yes. my god. I don't want it it's to It's so anymore. dramatic as well. <laughs> it's ruined metal. Fuck. But I totally get him. I mean, probably like two years before it, I wrote nastier comments online for sure. It's just what. I hope everything. I, I hope everything is like clear now on the old uh, fa- blabbermouth uh, comment section. <laughs> when it comes to my my comment. <laughs> That's it. Now. Look at the do look. You, do you get many people? Oh, sorry. Do you do you see many people just shitting over your artworks at the moment? Because I can't imagine that happening. <laughs> if I'm honest. Um. I- I mean, if it gets in front of uh, enough eyes, there'll be some some guy who just doesn't like it. Yeah, for sure. I think that's normal. Uh, 
but I mean, when when the criticism makes sense, like okay, th- there's like an anatomy problem with this character. I mean, the, the hand is too big, the nose is over. And I'm like, yeah. oh, maybe. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Well, where were you like two weeks ago? <laughs> that's too crazy. No, but you know, I mean, I was never um, aspiring to be. I mean, if it if it wouldn't, it wouldn't take so much uh, work, I, I was never aspiring to be like the most realist, ultra realistic, um, amazing uh, neoclassical painter out there. I think it was uh, always more about uh, storytelling and emotion for me. And and so you can for sure find some technical aspect because I'm I'm also untrained, so I'm I mean when my artwork goes in front of uh, people who are like more academic than me, for sure they're just having like I can't believe this kind of shit exists. You know? <laughs> Could be, um, but yeah, whatever. Uh, you can ignore it and you can actually grow from it and learn a little bit from it and stop ruining metal. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? To be, o- to be honest, I'm in a position where it's relatively more comfortable because bands, music in general, is judged way more harshly. I mean, in, in, in so many ways. I mean, when you guys are going to be older, people are just going to comment on the way you look uh, in comparison uh, to your age as well, and in with artwork, everybody's like nobody comments that these artists look old. I mean, yeah, artists they get prestige; they look better when yeah. they're old. <laughs> like people sometimes, I think, are uh, a little bit uh, disappointed. Like this this guy who looks like a dude. He, I thought he was like a serious painter. I imagine somebody <laughs> a little bit more old, dusty, and hunchback. <laughs> Yeah, gray hair, long beard. Yeah, exactly. So I'm, I'm growing into coolness <laughs> with time when time passes. But with bands, it's gonna be hard for you guys. So start walking out. <laughs> that's, true, that's, true. that's the band advice, guys. They're lining up some some surgeries for our faces, fillers. I'm just gonna take steroids. You gotta look the part. By the way, I've just been, I just realized that ev- throughout this entire conversation, I've been doing like, like farting noises with my hands. <laughs> so if, if anybody yeah, has heard anything noises. before, yeah, <laughs> go to the comment section and just timestamp. I, th- I think somebody farted. I, think somebody farted. Oh, I hope that becomes a thing. Just looking at the comments, I think somebody farted. <laughs> the longer we're going to talk about it, we're either going to make it a thing or suck the coolness out of it and it's not going to be a thing. <laughs> <laughs> but for the record, yeah, it's good. <laughs> so but yeah, it's... Say... Go ahead. Okay, I was just going to say, because you, you said you were untrained and I've, um, I've read somewhere before that it was your dad who introduced you to painting art when you were just a toddler. Mm. Uh, would you say that art kind of runs in your family? And have you been teaching your son to draw as well? My son is great at it, yeah, but I haven't been putting like a lot of pressure on them. He wants to paint, and I'm like, oh no, it creates such a mess. <laughs> ah. <laughs> I'm discouraging him <laughs> like the, the other way around because <laughs> I'm just lazy about cleaning up. <laughs> no, but my dad, yeah, my dad is great. My dad, um, was really more into uh, technical, realistic drawing when he was uh, younger. And we had a bunch of his stuff uh, hanging around the house, which was fantastic stuff. I mean, he's technically he's like much better than I am. And I remember he painted, like when I was a kid, he painted uh, my walls with like Disney characters. And I mean, we had a neighbor upstairs and he painted his walls with like characters from uh, Pink Floyd's The Wall. And uh, I was probably like four or five. And I remember thinking this is like the coolest thing ever. So when I got my own room, when I was 14, I painted over everything. There was nothing left of this uh, white wall. I I painted like Iron Maiden (laughs) on every square inch that I could find. Is that like your go-to uh, band for like art? Is like that's is that your favorite band for like artworks and stuff like that? 
Hmm. Uh, I think it's hard to go against uh, nostalgia because it carries um, it carries like a mental picture of where you are when you were first hit by this very impactful. It's not even about the artwork. It's like it's the music, the artwork, the subculture. It all hit me at once because it was one of my first experiences with heavy metal in general. So it was just an overload to the senses. But I think it stood the test of time because it was just so memorable. And it carried this very weird atmosphere and very unique look. And I think if it was just me, maybe I would have doubted. But it's all over the world. You can see people talking about how impactful Iron Maiden's artwork has been. And it inspired like basically every other band following them. I can't remember how many times I was asked to come up with a character, come up with a mascot. They would, every, all the bands were dancing around it, not trying to say, but we want a, an Eddie. <laughs> Everybody was saying, we want a mascot, we want our own character. Uh, I managed to avoid it pretty much. Except for the band Satan, which I've been drawing like the same character again and again for like four or maybe five albums by this point. Which is hard. Because this is why I, when I was younger, I thought about maybe getting into doing comic books. And then I realized that I, I can't draw the same thing over and over and over again. I get bored and I'm not good at that either. It doesn't look like the same character from one panel to the other. I think it's... I can imagine it being... It's, a, it's a similar to writing albums though, isn't it? Like, I think there's there's a lot to say for a band who can keep that consistent sound for like... 20 to 30 years like you think of bands like i don't know slayer or like maiden to an extent they pretty much maintain that same sound all the way through their career so it's kind of like yeah. having that it's got to be a seriously good formula isn't it and i think for bands it's like if you haven't got that perfect formula you need to just keep creating something new if you know what i mean that is a progression to yourselves but it's just not that same thing over and over that's probably why it's so difficult isn't it yeah yeah for sure and it's i mean you want to create something that uh, you want to build like this imaginary world where things have uh, their own lives things i mean characters and uh, settings and entire uh, places exist within this imaginary world but yeah, after but you have to be careful about this uh, fine balance between repeating yourself and moving forward. And Iron Maiden exact, uh, have actually been a big inspiration when it comes to this because I remember when so many people told me that uh, their favorite Iron Maiden album cover is Power Slave, I was like, that's amazing because that's only like 5%... Iron Maiden, like 95% of it doesn't even look like an Iron Maiden album cover, but because the the face of Eddie is so memorable that like tiny 5%, even even less of the entire uh, real estate of the album cover, that just makes it into an Iron Maiden album cover. So that set up like a template for me in order to think about in terms of how do I keep this like new album cover for a band who's established, let's say like a Testament or Iced Earth or whatever, or Halloween, taking something that will for sure resonate with the already established visual vocabulary of the band, but um, offer something new as well. So Power Slave was very uh, monumental in uh, me finding out about the balance yeah it, it does make sense doesn't it like and to get that balance perfectly is the art isn't it really because i think you can yeah. go too heavy with perfection and perfection can be you know just not exciting if it's you know perfected to the point where it has no human feel to it and it's the same in anything art music and that balance is really what i think the bands who kind of really shoot up are the ones that found that balance in themselves. Yeah, for sure. Somebody's hanging like a picture on the, on the wall or something. What is it? Yeah, that. I can hear that. It's not in Somebody's my banging over <laughs> there. Just Somebody's not a fan of this podcast. 
Like with, with a broomstick Sorry. going. <laughs> Shut up about your new album. Guess what? I've solved the problem. What Jasmine just decides to start hammering in the living room. Jasmine. I was just like, what, what are you, why are you doing this? I was like, oh, sorry. I was like, oh, great. Haven't, haven't she seen that uh, the calendar is marked? We have a podcast. Oh. You need one of those do not disturb sounds. Oh, I do need one. I do need one. Or like a red light outside. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> I'm going to make note of that. <laughs> no, because Which your is setup like... is... Yeah, sorry. I probably oh. just saying something stupid <laughs> i was gonna ask would you say that you've kind of it's established an aesthetic with venom prison as well because i do see with every artwork that you create for us that i would like i recognize this venom prison and for me yep. it's like this this human touch of the human body i think that's kind of yeah it's very it f- figurative i mean yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, when I approach uh, artwork for Venom Prison, I know that I'm going to do it in a very figurative way. I know that's going to be uh, an element to it which is uh, a little bit surreal. But at the same time, I think it's moving uh, more in the direction where... Um, because I remember when you guys first, first approached me, I was looking at your uh, the artwork that you had on the EPs, and um, I remember it was like more... Uh, w- one of them was very sur- surrealism-based. One of them was more uh, like neoclassical, I think. Yeah. And I didn't want to do straight-up uh, neoclassical with you guys because it's something that... Uh, I mean, I've been doing it uh, with bands like Soulfly and Hate Eternal as well. And I wanted to uh, sit down and find a way to make um, my collaboration with Venom Prison different than uh, when I'm approaching this band or the other band. So and I do it with each and every band that I, mm-hmm. I work with. Because it would make absolutely no sense that a band like My Dying Bride and a band like Sodom would have like the same album cover, uh, like the same style. It makes absolutely no sense. So because I'm a fan of the music and I can understand the difference between the like the subgenres, I can uh, sit down and make like more of, it's not like a very conscious plan, but I know that there are certain elements that I want to avoid and certain elements that I want to amplify when I'm working with Venom Prison, if that makes any sense. And I think when you put them side by side, all of the artworks that we've done, I mean, the, the reissue EP was something different, but it was made, uh, knowingly it was made in, in this way, because it's like it wasn't a full length, which is part of this series. It was more like revisiting your roots and rewrapping them. But I think when you put the three main albums side by side, it'll make sense together. And they will just create this like visual identity to the band and it will resonate with the music as well. Absolutely. A funny thing as well is uh, once you sent us the finished artwork, I showed it to everyone in the band and uh, Joe's first reaction was the colors are really similar. And if you put to like one of them and if you put them all next to each other you can create like one visual picture of it and um, it I, totally made sense to me I, how do I, I mean it's it's relatively bright but uh, it doesn't share the same um, the same palette as uh, no. as samsara uh, i really wanted to use pink <laughs> to be honest with you and I wanted to have like a, sort of like a faded greenish bre- background because it will just amplify the pink and the orange. So first thing, uh, I can remember who said that in your band, but get an eye check. Second thing is, <laughs> is just about, yeah, getting each and every album to have its own identity. Even when it comes to small things like the uh, the color palette, even the color palette for the for the logo. I didn't want to reuse something that'll be too close to uh, the last one. Absolutely. And but uh, I seriously wanted to use pink. Can't remember why. I think it's just because um, 
in my mind, I saw this entire scene as something that has something to do, I mean, um, some similarities between that and like a slaughterhouse, basically. So a lot of like pinky, uh, piggy flesh tones. Yeah. <laughs> makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. yeah, I know what you mean, though, with like the consistency of like just like it, they're not the same but it's like the consistency of like the aesthetic between them is really what builds that identity, doesn't it? And that's like, yeah. I was saying it to the guys, like, you know, before we seen the, um, the final one of it. And it was like, just knowing how it will look, even without, even without seeing it, just knowing how it will still look consistent with the others. And I think that's so important, isn't it really? If you're building an aesthetic and an identity to a band that, you know your music your yeah. music can change ever so slightly but that aesthetic if it stays the same it doesn't it doesn't throw people off i find a lot of bands will change the aesthetic of their sound their art and everything and it's too much of a shock to people i think it's not enough to, mm. to adjust and it's not enough to kind of ease yourself into it so i feel like even if your sound changes ever so slightly having that consistent aesthetic and something to identify you by I think it's, it's almost like a psychological thing, isn't it? Like you change mm. too much with the sound and the art and it really is that shock factor. But then if you keep consistency and change with it, it's seen as progression. It's... I totally get it. I mean, but on the other hand, there are a few bands that I really love who just completely change their direction, change everything, their direction, change everything. Their bands like uh, Ulver yeah. and, uh, and Arcturus, they, I mean, after the first album, they totally changed everything. And I, w I mean, if it's good, it's good. I, I never cared about uh, a band totally abandoning their sound if I liked the new song. Yeah. I think it's it's kind of and I love and I love all uh, eras of both bands. Yeah, it's like um, I think it's not so much in metal so much. Well, it does happen in metal, but like I get the older one, like you know the move they made was like it was a great move. But it's yeah. in like more mainstream music. It you know it seems to be like public don't identify with it so it that shock is really what throws them off before giving it a chance so it's not necessarily bad i think, I think in mainstream music you follow certain trends as well when it comes yeah. to your music and in uh, with your visuals i don't think it's necessarily the same with metal there are obviously certain trends that bands pick up but i like i don't really think it's that necessary or is that much of a big big impact for metal i think i, I mean i think what uh, fans are tuning out is usually when uh, the change feels forced it feels calculated and it feels fake yeah uh, uh if I mean, if a change feels like something that uh, is so genuine and also refreshing and original as well, and if there's a good, I mean, when it comes to music, if there's a good hook in it, I mean, I would actually prefer than bands releasing uh, stuff that's way too similar. But again, if it's good, it's good. I, I love bands who haven't changed their sound either. But if the new songs just have, like, great material in them it doesn't matter that the style didn't change too much since the 80s or whatever yeah definitely no i was ne never I, seriously it's, stuff needs to be judged on based on how good the music is and that's about it but people just get attached to it you know people get like oh they betrayed me I, i'm so sure this band yeah, is about this that's kind of what i was like that's kind of like how i was getting at it like you have people that are so attached that it's almost that shock, isn't it, of change that they just can't accept and it it becomes their most hated record. And then in reality, if they really just sat down with it and, you know, listened, they'd be like, you know what? There's nothing wrong with this. It's just I couldn't get used to it. 
Yeah, and I mean, l- l- lucky for me, I work with uh, with bands that are really different from one another. So even if I keep very um, on a very narrow path with one band, I still have a few bands that have like completely different aesthetics to them. So it's not like I've been uh, redoing the same thing over and over again. And one of my, I mean, when this album came out with uh, Testament's Dark Woods of Earth, I got so many emails from uh, like these uh, retro, retro trash bands asking basically to rip it off. And I remember like consciously saying, okay, if I'm going to do this, then I'm going to be that guy only does this. I mean, even, even if you don't consider the um, uh, business angle of it, I'll be just miserable if I'll be doing the same thing over and over again, and especially ripping off myself. So it's horrible because uh, sometimes when you come up with something very successful, you just have to say no to everything um, or to all the business opportunities that came from it because everybody just want to rip it off. So it's like, yeah, I really something su- successful. Yeah, now I just, I don't do anything with the opportunities that have risen from it because they are all just bad opportunities. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I understand that. Yeah, it's just, it same thing now. As well. Yeah, yeah, for Sorry. sure. It doesn't, it doesn't benefit the bands. It doesn't benefit me in any way. It doesn't benefit their albums because I would probably would have done it, uh, you know, begrudgingly, you know, without any truly like fire under my ass while I was doing it. It was, I would not be enthusiastic doing it. Yeah. And I'm in the same situation now with the Halloween album cover because ev- ev- people seem to like the Halloween album cover, but I only like like two bands in this entire genre. So I had to, to choose very wisely what I'm going to do because I, I could just do now power metal for the next couple of years yeah but I just i was i love halloween i love blind guardian but that's basically it but still whenever a band comes to me and they write to me i always spend a little bit time uh, going over a few songs even if they come from a genre that i a sub genre that i usually don't listen to because i'm truly still excited about uh finding out about new exciting music and I give the the benefit of a doubt to anybody to knock knock my socks off, regardless of what your genre is, for sure. Yeah, I can imagine it's it's cool to watch like a band grow over the years that you've worked with like consistently and stuff, and it's kind of like seeing them from when you first met them, you know, to where they've yeah. got to, and it's like I can imagine that's kind of quite a rewarding feeling to know that you've you know been part of the process there's so many great bands that you've done artwork for and you've actually not been there just for one but multiple you know yeah it's it's been amazing because i know how how i mean it's easier for me because i i'm not dependent on um on how successful my art is with a larger audience because i only need to appeal to like 20 something bands in a year in order to maintain this career but you guys it's like a one in a million shot to be like a successful band i mean how many bands are there i mean you can you can count on a few hands how many will get to you to your position and to get the opportunities that you've earned with the time so with whatever i do with with the bands because i also um came from this scene i know tons of, i mean tons of my friends have formed bands when i was for uh going into this career i also tried my hand in music when i was like in in high school and everything but it was soon i soon found out that it wasn't a thing for me but tons of my friends have started bands so i was really involved with it in like a community uh sort of sense so it was very important to me to realize that this is quite uh quite an important role to be able to be put in this position when you need to supply the bands with something that can help them grow basically because everything is crucial when it comes to uh, the growth of a band. I mean, how important is like a hat? Just ask Guns N' Roses. How important is like a picture of a skull? Just ask Misfits. It's 
everything can be super crucial. The logo, the band name, the band photos. So I'm just one of those guys who contribute something that sort of acts like a multiplier because the music is like the most important thing for sure. But everything else can amplify it, can act like a, a multiplier. If the music sucks, then you're multiplying by zero when you get zero. But when you give other in interesting dimensions to the band, you can elevate it. You can elevate the music and create. You fill in the gaps when it comes to different dimensions that music doesn't come with because music doesn't come naturally with visuals music doesn't come inherently with like a logo and a band photo you, you need to supply it and it's important to we, that we supply it with stuff that's impactful stuff that is honest that we are honest about that we are honestly excited about and stuff that it's going to be you know a little bit original and memorable for sure yeah that that is there's definitely you know i think that's what we've tried to do with this record is just make sure that everything's memorable like that is the thing in it that's been the key to this album is memorable memorable yeah I, and it's with everything i do even when i do like very um complex stuff i try not to lose um uh, the importance of a focal point even when and also don't do complete i don't do complex stuff just for the sake of it in it when i use it it's just like a tool in order to create this sort of a certain feeling yeah what so what is it you usually look for when you start so and i how how does your idea spur like how what's the first things you'll go to like the lyrics or if you have pre-production but like how do you know when you found that moment of what you're going this, for? This time I had nothing, right? I didn't have the lyrics. <laughs> I, yeah, I just told you what the album was about. I, you yeah. told me that, yeah, that you've been touching a lot about, uh, in many of your lyrics, you were touching about uh, on many topics of uh, incarcerations and uh, living in captivity. And I remember, I mean, most of my ideas are born when I'm trying to fall asleep, basically. And this one, I was lying in bed sideways, I was like this, in, in total darkness. And I remember thinking, whoa, right now I just look super weird from the outside. If somebody from the outside would look at me and if my eyes would be opened a bit, it would be very... Um, very intense and weird and i remembered some of the um stories that my grandfather used to tell me about uh his life in world war ii and i remembered that he told me about uh, how he never recognized couldn't recognize uh, the version of him that was a, a kid and then a teenager because he considered that uh, version of him to be dead and left there in the somewhere in a field in Poland. And I remember him telling me about how he just he's not the same guy that saw his entire family being sent away forever. So I uh, this concept was born out of these two uh, elements. One of them was the actual physical visual element of thinking about myself lying down uh, facing sideways looking at darkness and him my grandfather telling me about basically how he got desensitized to violence and horror because he was just a kid experiencing like the ultimate horror and uh, these two elements were brought in together to create uh the concept for the album cover and afterwards when i was working on it then um, the color palette uh, came to mind as i said earlier because of thinking about maybe a slaughterhouse thing maybe about like skin that's a bit like piggish or even like if you look at some of the characters you can see uh, just cow like stains cow like uh, textures on them like weird patterns Sometimes if you look like, like a belly of 
of an animal. You can see these uh, weird stains and patterns. And it all connected to this, uh, to, to create this feeling of uh, horror and captivity. Yeah, I, I honestly, I, I can't wait to like show it to when we get to thing because I the moment without exaggerating the moment like Larissa showed me and I I I think the first word I just said was incredible I was like I it is exactly like there wasn't even a moment of like a moment of looking at it I was just like right thank you that's that is incredible everyone that has seen it so far especially the people at Century uh media they just completely blown away. My Gitter messaged me after he had seen it on Instagram and was like, "Thank you for this amazing artwork. It's oh, so incredible." Yeah, I, I'll I'll tell him uh, thank you. I've never I've never worked with with the guy. I've I've we have friends in common and I know who is, but uh, he never reached out to me. He's so. I'll tell him that you. I'll tell him that you sent it. I mean, he's is he your A and R over there? Yeah. Yeah, Mike Gitter is. I'm ex I'm excited to work with him. I really am excited. Like we met him in LA, um, and yeah. he was he was really cool. Like I think he's really gonna. I think he's really gonna be a great addition to helping the band. I really do. Oh, that's great because all of my past experience with uh, Century Media was nothing but positive. Yeah, I think we can say the same so far. Yeah, we really feel like part of the family, to be honest. It's feel taken care of. Everyone's really friendly. Everyone's hands on, like super great in communication. Everyone seems to be super nice. It's really, really cool. Yeah. And now they're here in, in Berlin, I think. Which, uh, yo, yeah, my wife had this amazing idea. I should uh, talk to them about having an exhibition over there at maybe their headquarters now that things are open. I'll talk to to them and see because there will be like a great opportunity to also exhibit the new Venom Prison artwork as well next to the other ones. Yeah, that'd be really cool. That's a really cool idea. That's a, that's a great I'll, idea. I'll put it right next to the I Stealth one so you'll be <laughs> in, in, in good... <laughs> Like-minded political company. <laughs> that would make a hell of a photo. It would make a hell of a meme, wouldn't it? <laughs> ah. <laughs> <laughs> so, how long have you lived in in Berlin now? Oof, since two thousand and nine. I've been. I'm actually right now in uh, where I used to live in my old uh, apartment. Now serves as my studio in Friedrichshain. And I just, I still feel the same way about uh, this neighborhood, about the entire city, but uh, about the, particularly this neighborhood. It just, I think the city is something that uh, it's so easy to feel at home over here because it's it's got many facets to it. You can be like an old retiree guy who wants to grow carrots in the uh, in a rented um, uh, this one of those country houses that you only get yeah, uh, that you only rent out yeah just to uh, grow some uh, vegetables in the garden so you can be this guy or you can be the, like the most intense party person you can find and Berlin will feel like a home to you so it's got many faces to it and uh, ever since I got here for the first time, my dad took me here when I was 16 and I immediately liked it. I, I love Berlin. It's one of my favorite cities, probably my favorite city in, in Europe. It's uh, I lived in Germany for the bigger part of my life and I've spent so much time in Berlin. But I always feel like I haven't explored it enough every time I come back because there's so many new things that I discover or see somewhere online, like places I've never been to. Just like the the museum that you uh, posted the picture of mm. um, the other day where you went to uh, with uh, Nurgle, uh, the Pergamon Museum. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, do, do you go to... Uh, places like museums or any other art exhibitions or any cool stuff 
that just makes you feel really cool to in Berlin? I actually usually when I go there I take bands because whenever you live in a place you tend to quickly become not a tourist anymore and like oh no that's a touristy thing to do and then you've been living in the same place in like over a decade and you haven't seen like half of it because you're like oh no. um my scene is the the supermarket but whenever there's there's guests i mean family friends bands then i get into tourist guide mode and i go to all the cool places I, they probably think that i go there like every week or so but i <laughs> on, only on special occasions when they come here <laughs> yeah day to day life i'm uh, i'm a dad a dad metal i go to the kindergarten to pick up my kid go shopping that's it <laughs> walk hang i mean hang around in playgrounds with my kid that's it i mean but i mean because he's he's now he's four now and he he made makes me realize how the world is so incredible in the eyes of like a four year old he's now excited about like any everything is like for he's like dad for the weekend i want to go on the urban number four. That's it. It's like super exciting for me because it's never been on the Uber number four. It's like it's a train. It's the same thing as every other train, but it's number four, not like the number two that we drive on, that we go on like every week. So that's like a weekend plan. And when we're over there, it's like hanging by the edge of his seat. Like, wow. Oh. <laughs> that's so cute. I think uh, like between two and four is like, one of my favorite ages for kids for sure i have nephews and nieces and i think that's where the most they're the most interesting and just the cutest because uh, you just see these things in them and the innocence that they have yeah. that you kind of don't see anywhere else and i think it's quite fascinating yeah he's, he's amazing seriously and he i mean rediscovering the joys of childhood all over again like playing with L legos that's you just you just lost lose track of time i just have been playing with these legos for like three hours now <laughs> but yeah yeah it's it's been amazing and we take advantage of everything that uh, the city has to to offer i guess yeah because we i i try to to take him to uh like to eat, we I love taking him out to, to eat at restaurants and I love taking him out to just discover because the city is so huge we just travel inside the city and just look at new uh, neighborhoods that we've never been to and it's amazing for him and it's amazing for, for me as well because this is just I've I haven't been to half of what this town has to offer so it's amazing it's massive I mean if but if it's such a yeah, like your favorite spot how come uh, you never moved here? I don't really know. I think when when it was the time for me to to move to Berlin, I kind of moved to the UK instead. Everyone that I knew from where I lived, because I, I lived in Essen, mm -hmm. which is in Ruhrgebiet, and um, most of the people that I knew moved out to Berlin, and maybe I just didn't you wanted wanna... to be cool. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to be cool, and I kind of didn't want to hang out with those people anymore. I guess. So you moved in the opposite direction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I get it. If that's the kind of people who move to Berlin, yeah, that's that's yeah. not my scene. I guess. <laughs> it's such a huge city, though, that you you won't yeah, you will probably true. even won't run into them yeah I, well ever since i've been back i didn't really run into them i still meet some friends that have moved up there every time we're there and it's really cool but yeah i i moved here instead <laughs> it's so hard to manage to meet up with people you really want to meet up with i can't imagine running into people you don't need to you don't want to meet up with <laughs> it's it, yeah it's, it's been weird but but yeah, living in here has been, I don't know, its it just f felt so relaxing. Uh, I'm originally from Israel and uh, living in here has been uh, pretty much re more relaxing to me. 
It's like way less intense, I guess. What's the difference? Um, mainly. Mainly, I can't put my finger of it on it. It's it's a metal. It, it, it's an atmosphere, and in in Israel things tend to be intense. I don't want to. Uh, I, I want to be careful with my words and not get too too deep into why. Because if you left some some place and moved to another place, that means that you just you prefer it. But it's just what's right for me. It's not about okay, that place sucks. I mean, look, yeah. I, I've got many friends that I tell them no, don't don't try and move in here. Just it's not for you. I know you, your personality. It's not it's. It won't speak to you in the same way that it spoke to me. I'm just different. Yeah, everyone's different, aren't they? And I think, you know, lots of people, like, people find different places that they would... It's more suited, isn't it? Like, I, I currently live somewhere that's, like, a bit quiet. And, you know, I think I'm yeah. at that point now where I'm kind of ready to just get around a bit more civilization. That's a way of wording it. But, like, yeah. I, I was born here and I grew up here. Um, and I always like didn't see a problem with it, but when I got to like my mid twenties, coming up to like now my thirties, um, I just feel like it's not. I need more. I need more atmosphere. I need more around me. I need more happening. I need more interaction. And I think it happens with a lot of people, doesn't it? You just it suits your needs, you know, differently. But it, you probably saved some money by not moving uh, like last year because you'll move to to like a big city, pay a lot and won't see anybody because you were just locked down in yeah. your <laughs> apartment for all the entire year. Yeah, there is that in there. That... With, with me, I've, I've been moving about pretty much since I was a kid. I was born in Russia. I moved to Germany when I was 10. Uh, but in Germany, I moved to probably three different cities and then I moved to the UK and I've moved around here as well. I think I'm just not really used to staying in one place for too long but um, I do think that I'd like to come back to Germany at some point. Uh, quality of life is just very different there. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, I never tried uh, moving into to the UK, but from what I've heard, it's a little bit more rough. But uh, yeah. yeah, but I've been the same. I've been traveling before I settled down in here. I I was traveling for a while as well. I almost moved to the Czech Republic. Thought about me even even moving to Italy at some point, but didn't last long. I can't imagine you in Italy. I don't know. You can't or I you can? I, I, I can't. Like, if I picture you in Italy, I, I just, it doesn't look right. I'm originally Mediterranean, so. <laughs> I, mean, I, I would just act like more Mediterranean over there. Over, over here in Germany, I some, sometimes feel. Uh, like the the rude uh, outsider. Like I mean, we are the apartment that uh, makes noise. We are the guys that, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our, our dog is loud. We are just well, I don't know, p probably. <laughs> we are a little bit uh, carrying that stereotype. <laughs> Could, could be, I don't know. So, yeah, but sometimes I feel like more, like less balanced and more hot-headed than uh, my surroundings. My kid was born here though, so he's like he's he's local. <laughs> he's a he's a Berliner. He's a Berliner, yeah. But he gets like, but he gets a lot of his uh, personality traits from living with uh, my wife and I too. So he's like <laughs> a very cool mix, I guess. That sounds really cool. My sister lives in Bavaria, but she's obviously like me, like Russian, but also grew up in uh, in Ruhrgebiet. And now the kid is kind of, or her children are kind of like a massive mix of all kinds of cultures. 
and now she they go to nursery school so kindergarten and uh they speak like the bavarian um dialect uh, dialect now so it's it's really funny to watch them just like navigate for different languages and dialects um, my kid speaks german way better than i do and uh, it's becoming embarrassing <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah i i feel like it i am such a bad immigrant <laughs> to, yeah i know there was a, a funny scene on the playground we went uh where we live there's tons of like um uh, international families and we were on the playground and he wanted and there was like an american family and my kid went to to uh, a small child and she, she was a girl she was basically his age i think and he was talking to her in german and she was talking in english and he didn't understand her because he doesn't speak english and it was like in german he was yelling telling her Please speak German. <laughs> and I was like, I, I ran quickly just to tell her parents, no, no, he just doesn't understand English. We're not one of those speak German when you're <laughs> around here. And, it's, and I felt, oh, I can't believe uh, th- these parents maybe thought I was the the local Nazi authority. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> That's awkward. That's an awkward one. Speak German. <laughs> no. <laughs> that happened to Ash actually on uh, an U-Bahn in Dortmund mm. when he didn't have a ticket to be on the U-Bahn and then he sp- didn't speak German and uh, the guy who was basically checking the tickets was like, you're in German, you speak German. Even though he spoke perfect English. Hang on, he, he, took, he took my... Uh, my- uh, cash point cards. Yeah, you run off on my cash point cards. So I, <laughs> so I chased after him. Did he have like uniforms or was it just a random guy? Uniform. Okay. They called yeah. the police on me. Could... Okay, I thought you were supposed to call the police on him because it sounds uh, fishy. <laughs> <laughs> All I wanted to do was see the dinosaur museum. I saw... It was close oh, as well. <laughs> Where was it? Don't. Because I want to. I want to go. I wherever I go, I want to see the dinosaur museum. I went like four times with my kid. I think it was. It was in Dortmund. Yeah. This is where we should go next time in Berlin. Go to the Naturkunden Museum. Yeah, they, I couldn't get over it though. Like the guy just like took my bank cards and just like ran off with it, and then called the police on me. And I was like, oh. I was like, I, I don't even know. It was. Hang on, I did buy a ticket. It wasn't in the right direction. That was it, wasn't it? Something it like was, that. It wasn't the right That zone. was it. Oh, okay. But I did buy a ticket, but he wasn't having any of it. And then I was like trying to explain that it was, you know, obviously the wrong ticket by accident. And then that's when he just started saying, speak German. And I was like, well, hey, here we go. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, there are many colorful characters everywhere. Yeah. Too right. That's, Too right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but 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 it's funny when we tend to be we joke about about the, the locals that uh, it's kind of like a pastime activity to do like this to people. It's like no, 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 that's not the right way. It's sort of like when you put the divider in uh, between on your grocery store or in your grocery in store. Supermarket. It's like if you don't do it, you get the, like the stale. <laughs> yeah. But it's it's basically that's probably us looking uh, for uh, reinforcements of our uh, stereotypes. You sh- probably most people are just the same uh, everywhere. But if you find somebody who enforces your stereotype of the like the local costumes, they're like, ah, I knew everybody's around here is like this. Yeah. Yeah. But but it's actually like that in Germany. I would say people Germans love to follow the rules. Um, when we stayed at my parents as a band, because we were on tour and we, we just stayed there in between shows, and um, in the morning we were leaving and Mike um, was tidying up the van, so he took a bin bag and just put it into someone else's bin, just outside the house, 
And then um, my dad has seen it, and he was like running outside. I was like, "Oh no!" Because <laughs> he had seen the neighbor coming out and like shouting at at Mike, being like, "Why are you putting your rubbish into my bin?" And then my dad had to take the the bag out of the bin. And was like, "I'm so sorry." <laughs> I I guess yeah, people in here tend to be a bit sensitive about the trash bins. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I I got a few angry letters in my days, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, there was just maybe a, like a couple of weeks ago even, yeah. There was no no more place for cardboard, so I put it like inside a box next to it. And they took the, the time to take a photo of my details that on it that proves that this is my cardboard, my cardboard box. And send me like uh, an angry letter. It's it's like it's not really angry. It's like um, uh, passive aggressive angry because it starts off with uh, dear the dear whoever it, it would, might concern, and at the end it's like uh, kind regards. So it's passive aggressive, yeah. and and even in the middle it's like they don't yell at you or something. It's like. If you keep on doing this, we will have to pay for another trash bin just for your cardboard. <laughs> and I got angry because this entire uh, building got, I mean, it got gentrified. So they basically uh, bought the apartments of each and every one of those people who've been living in here for years now. And those are like new tenants. They're outsiders, like, like new Ber Berliners. They don't even speak German, and I and now I'm the guy who's like, well, how come everybody speaks English in this building all of a sudden? <laughs> what's what's going on with this neighborhood? <laughs> so I'm now I'm the there goes the neighborhood guy, <laughs> and I got this letter. I was like, who, who are you to write me this letter? How long have you been in this building? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm getting more and more local. <laughs> I'm getting, I'm becoming a true angry old German guy. <laughs> yeah. It happens fast. It happens fast. I'm kind of getting more uh, like a gammon sometimes. Like, you know, like a what? An English, <laughs> an English gammon. What's gammon? As you say. A what? As you say. A gammon. Oh, gammon. Yeah. Oh. Describe what it we is. We don't like. say gammon here, so I don't know. We don't say... No. I don't say... What is it? It's like a. How do I describe it without sounding too offensive? I mean, the word gammon is kind of offensive. <laughs> Every word is offensive these days. Um, <laughs> we we don't. I've lost we track don't, of what we was. We saying. wouldn't say it. We wouldn't say it here. But like. What do you say in Wales? Like, are you just trying to say like, you know, you just become like. I don't know how to word it. <laughs> I know what you mean though. It's like kind of just like thing everything starts to like annoy you like you've got you know i can't explain it i know what just say what you think you i won't tip blabber mouth on it um it's... i won't tell it to anybody so it's a i'm, I'm currently on urban dictionary so a gammon is a collective for noun for white middle-aged furious-faced furious british like... people yeah. That's gammon. That's a gammon. So basically, wherever uh, in old like Monty Python skits where they were dressed as old ladies and punch you with umbrellas, that's it? It's got to be middle-aged. It's got. Yeah, it has yeah, to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's... They were on oh, middle-aged. It can't be old. No, it's got to be middle-aged. All oh, right, so, okay. So we got to... Not it, old. Yeah, it's like... It's, so, it's such a British thing. Like, I... It, and yeah. it... It's hard to it's do. When is middle age? Because I'm suspecting that I'm getting middle age. I'm 37. When is middle age now? I don't even know. 45? Yeah, I think. Please, please make it be 45 uh, or 40. Yeah, I, I don't know. Does it have to be like in the, like half of life expectancy? Hang on, let's find out. 45 to 65 is considered middle age. 45. To 65. Yeah. All right, so I'm not middle-aged yet. 
It's Just weird to me to be in this position where basically tons of the bands that I work with are now younger than me. When I started getting into this profession, everybody was like, oh, you're, he's the kid. <laughs> and now I got, I can't remember when was it. It was in, in Wacken and in the exhibition. And the guys from of Mice and Men came to me and they said, we grew up on your artwork. And I was like, I was talking to my, uh, my merch guy, who, who are this band? And he said, oh, they're, <laughs> they're, they're big, they're very famous, they're like a, a new band. And for me, like a new band is something from the last uh, like decade or so. I mean, everything past, uh, everything past Dying Fetus is deathcore to me. This, makes- is how old, this is how old I am. That kind of makes sense. That does actually make sense. Yeah. Yeah, basically. <laughs> so, are we deathcore? Are you deathcore? Yeah. I, I don't know. Could you be? I don't know. We don't. We don't know. People keep answering it for us, but we don't actually know. Yeah. We don't even know what genre we are. People just keep typing it on the internet. Now I'm, I'm a little bit associated with the genre because I've been working with uh, uh, Die Art is Murder and Aversion's Crown and uh, Heaven Shall Burn. And it all sounds like death metal to me. I, I don't get the core thing. Yeah, I think... I, I don't really fully understand it. If someone said, like, name death core bands, like, they are pretty much what I would say is a death metal band. You know what I mean? With, like, like breakdowns at the end, it has to go and low to, like, halftime and have a chuggy... But then it, it just sounds like dying... The end. But then it's just dying fetus, isn't it? Exactly, because dying fetus and suffocation had that stuff in, like, 96. Yeah, that's why it confuses yeah. me. I, I'm still yet to understand, like, how deathcore is kind of... Everyone said it was death metal and hardcore, but if you're a hardcore band that takes death metal influence, you don't call yourself deathcore. It's really confusing. I think they, I think they go by haircuts. If you have short hair and, like, neck tattoos, deathcore. Yeah, yeah, no, it's true. I think it's true. I think. Oh my god, I just remembered. Uh, You're hiding your neck. <laughs> I'm hiding my neck. <laughs> when the first, uh, our first band photo uh, was posted on Prosthetic Records and we signed with them, and there was people actually just uh, <laughs> commenting and like making fun of of us for like having short hair. <laughs> this is why he gave up to peer pressure. This is did he has yeah, did he, he had, have short hair? He had long hair. He had long hair. It was Mike and Ben who had short hair in the band, and everyone was just ripping on them. And Ben has long hair now. <laughs> I'm going through the same phase too. I have to. I, I can't ruin the metal anymore. We were gonna ruin metal if we didn't grow our hair. <laughs> No, no, the po- yeah. the poser police will be all over us. <laughs> I was actually concerned when when I cut my hair short because it was really long first, and then I cut it up to here, and then I was like, "Oh, what are people gonna say? Like, are they gonna say I'm not metal anymore? <laughs> like, if, if I can't headbang anymore?" Did you? <laughs> but was there, like anybody like at management or label concerned because you had like this very specific look at some point with like the yeah. the white hair. And that, yeah. did you get some um, like comments from management or uh, labels say, saying, "Ah, oh, it, it changed"? No. It. no. We, almo- we did, almost I had was, like a, an action figure <laughs> made out, but then you ruined it. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm I'm kind of growing it out again now. Uh, see what happens. People started calling me Ghost Main Copy. But I found that funny as well. I, I, had <laughs> I found... white hair. I had white hair before Ghostman. So, fuck you, Ghostman. <laughs> I did find that comment funny as well. Though it was, it was, it was a good comment. Yeah, if that, I mean, yeah, I think. I mean, when it comes to those subgenres, I think there are just so many bands right now that people just don't have uh, like time to check out everything because you won't seriously if you try to like sample one song out of every band that exists you won't get to the end of it so if they if a, if the audience manages to find a small difference between metal core uh, death core and death metal then it automatically automatically like um, makes it like okay we need to only check that half of the bands 
yeah and it makes it more like more manageable yeah so when it comes to um going for all of those comments a lot of people's opinions yeah it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be long i mean i i try to go through the comments and check out everything but it's getting longer and longer until a point where you go okay there's no way i mean people who have like one one hundred thousand followers on social media they probably don't bother checking out each and every comment no no it's like impossible yeah Yeah. no way which is sad because it's easy for that as well which is sad because it's like some of those messages are like long and heartfelt and everything and it's like i'm I'm sorry i was just not gonna read it it's just not possible is it i don't think it's because they don't want to i think it's just impossible isn't it like you said sometimes it just goes under in a sea of message requests and stuff like that and you just you just can't go for all of them the thing is you they the ever you know the people or the person or people receiving the comments they also have lives outside of that particular purpose don't they and it's kind of like when you know we're talking about big you know big influential people they have families or like other avenues that they explore and it it must be difficult to keep up with that, you know what I mean? But people do get offended, don't they? Oh, yeah. That's weird. There was one instance with us on Twitter. Was there? Where so- someone got really offended because we didn't retweet oh. uh, their tweet. And they haven't even tagged Ven in prison because Ash uh, often just retweets people saying cool things or whatever. And that one person didn't get a retweet because they didn't tag us and they got really upset and they actually destroyed um, a tab book and posted <laughs> yeah. a picture. Yeah, it. I know. <laughs> Wild, isn't it? Like, it was nothing intentional. It was nothing... To, you know it's just some sometimes this... i mean sometimes there is substance in 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 online rage but it's it gets misdirected uh, a few uh, like months ago i walked with this band that uh, afterwards it turned out that uh, one member has like uh, serious ele- allegations against him for for sexual abuse and rape and everything it and all those allegations came up like a year after I worked with those those guys, and one of his um, uh, accusers just wanted to bring this to my attention. So her way of doing it was just she pasted uh, on Instagram a photo of him, this guy, and it said like abuser, rapist, uh, whatever, and then Eliran Cantor next to it, and it's like it's a picture of a dude. Nobody, I mean, I mean, most of the, the this planet doesn't know how, how I look like. I don't know. How, when I saw it, I was like, who is this dude? I have no idea. But it said like, rapist, abuser, Eliran Kanto. And it was, <laughs> oh it was a tag in order to bring this to my attention. <sighs> but, and all of a sudden, and she, and she was like, uh, um, a, a suicide girl. So she had a lo- lot of suicide girl friends who have like many followers so all of a sudden this image image was shared by girls who have like 50,000 followers and it got like in a matter of like three hours it was seen by who knows how many people and then I was reached out to uh, they were like angry for me not saying not uh, making like a public comment about me working with this guy and my response was just Hold on for a sec. Not even that. I don't even know this guy. I didn't even know him. Just please take off this picture saying like, rapist abuser and my name next to it. Yeah. That was just so, so crazy. And That's that, that was fucked up. And yeah. They don't like that. And the, the, the accusation sounds like they have tons of substance to them, but I. I don't involve me in this way. Just if you want to bring something to my attention, message me directly. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think it was probably something that happened in a moment of despair and rage, like you yeah, said. For sure. And if you just don't think about what what you're doing, that can happen. And I think it's if I would have seen something like that with my name on it, I'd be so horrified. Awesome. Yeah, you you kind of think that everyone jumps to the worst and like just directs it straight at you. You know what I mean? They don't look yeah, at the, sure. the finer detail. It's just like that's the first thing they see. It's the first thing they think, and it's like uh, it, that's you know what I mean? Like like you yeah, said, it's, uh, a, it's terrible, but. And it wasn't like it. W- I was tagged along with like blabbermouth and loudwire and whatever that she wanted to bring this to the attention of many people. I just happened to be one of the guys who provided artwork for his band. And I mean, that's it. That's my involvement. Yeah. I, I mean, I wasn't the producer wasn't tagged. The mixing guy wasn't tagged. It was so random to have only my name over there. That is very random. This reminds me of an instance with um, what's his name, the Lost Prophets guy. Oh yeah. Oh, uh, Ian Watkins. But you're talking about hate yeah. from steps. Yeah. So it's just someone having the same name and getting all the hate Oof. when people just can't distinguish who the actual person is. I bet that was fucking horrifying. Well, he had like he had so much hate messages, didn't he? Because like people just like obviously the guy's name that was called H in Steps, whose name was also Ian Watkins, and like mm-hmm. everyone just went like we're just posting photos of him, you know. Even like news articles were picking up on it and being like, "Singer from Steps has done this, 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 and this," and like. This guy's just there, just having his whole world crushed around him because someone just hasn't read the finer detail. Uh, now I'm so happy that I have this like weird name. Like, like that. That was like such a big thing. It was. It was wild because he was like, they had to do like almost like a press campaign just to make sure people realised that he wasn't the one that they were on about. Oh yeah. So for you know a couple of months, his life was probably insane oh for sure and you can get so many eyes right now on on something i mean uh, i i have this thing with my mother i always tell them that just stop sharing those stuff on facebook none of what you share is is real just like what i saw it on like my friend's profile where did she get it from and i was like yeah from the same whatever conspiracy whatever page that uh, that you saw it on i guess it's not like if it's, it's i mean older generations are like oh, we read somewhere um so it must be real yeah, yeah could be it's just so accessible isn't it it's so accessible and it's just in your hands and like you're flicking through stuff and something catches your eye and your brain's just almost thinking, you know, it's almost thinking ahead, isn't it? Like you're just scrolling and it's like your brain's just on fast forward and then it goes, oh, interesting. And you don't really think. And then before you know it, you've built a picture in your head before you've even read the story. Yeah, for sure. And I try, I mean, I try to be more responsible uh, with how I conduct myself online right now. And... I mean, when it comes to voicing my opinion over things, uh, my rule of thumb is that um, when it comes to matters like politics, my opinions are basically nothing that you haven't heard before. Uh, Not so original. So either you agree with me already, which won't... So it means that hearing me saying that won't persuade you, or you're on the other end and you're you won't be uh, into it because you've heard it before said by other people who think the same as I do and they didn't convince you. So me repeating the same thing won't convince you either. So I try, when I'm passionate about something, I try to think about, okay, by saying that, am I contributing something new to the um, big conversation? Because there are so many voices and everybody is just going on at once. I try to be the one who maybe uh, will introduce um, a new point of view. And if not, if I don't have a point of view, because sometimes you're right, but you're just right in a very 
mainstream way because everybody thinks the same as you but, but it's right so i just in those cases i just keep my mouth mouth shut basically <laughs> i also think that especially at the moment there's so many people that think that their opinion on something matters and they want to put it out there when in reality like i don't care what you think i have my own beliefs and opinions i i like i don't need to go and read about what someone else has to say so um just because you have an opinion doesn't mean it matters that's my thinking yeah this is why usually i try to uh address only the facts the logic the yeah. science behind stuff but i quickly gave up <laughs> to be honest with you even <laughs> even when it comes to like basic science this last couple of years of i mean this last year and a half has been so hard especially if you try to follow what your friends and family have been saying online it's uh, it got brutal so yeah i i hold it for maybe like one-on-one -on -one conversations but even then, uh, I just, you know, okay, the, it, this is one person. Maybe yeah. maybe my energy is uh, more useful being directed elsewhere. <laughs> Sorry for giving up, but yeah. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Uh, but, I, I agree with you. But I think when it comes to, to art, I... I, I try to put forward something that I think is is interesting. I think we all try to put forward something that we would actually like to to listen to to watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Back to watching. <laughs> we spoke about TV series before I started recording. Uh, what is your favorite movie of all time, though? Shit, that's a that's a horrible question. And that's a... A... <laughs> really, I, I'm such a I'm such not a movie buff. I can seriously, I can't tell you. No, no idea. I respect. That. No idea what's my, <laughs> my what's my favorite movie. I I can tell you some stuff that have been so impactful for me growing up. Uh, when I when my dad played me uh, Pink Floyd's The Wall for the first time when I was uh, like maybe I was five, this was my introduction to so many things. It went my introduction to the combination of uh, of visuals and music in a way that the visuals uplift uh, amplify music. It was my introduction basically to horror. Because some of those, some parts of that movie are really horrifying, especially for when if you're like four or five. And it was something that uh, I carried with me. I mean, some of those um, animation scenes are some of the most memorable scenes uh, for me to this day when it comes to, uh, to cinema. And afterwards, uh, watching all the Monty Python things was mm -hmm. really impactful as well this is how i basically got the idea of using um neoclassical aesthetics uh, in a way to create this like grotesque effect because when i do stuff that has to do with uh, cl neoclassical aesthetics i don't do like straight up neoclassical i usually use it as a tool in order to create something that's a little bit timeless that's a little bit more like a fairy tale where uh all the characters and what they do, I mean, the setting itself and the characters become like very neutral because it can be something that happens today. It can be something that happens 400 years ago. It could be in any place, like, like a fairy tale, like a folklore tale. And so this is where, I mean, the animation stuff that Terry Gilliam did in Monty Python, that was a huge inspiration for, uh, for that aesthetic. And then afterwards, I think... Uh, like yeah, watching like the Elm Street movies when I was like 11 that was my uh, I mean each generation has their horror but that was my horror because I was I think 11 back then and we would we would watch these movies 
you know, uh, with the lights on at like three in the afternoon because it was so scary for us. And we would gather up as many friends as possible to watch it with us because we were so afraid of it. <laughs> and then afterwards I got into, I don't know, I remember really liking Edward Scissorhands and Murder in the First, I thought was a great movie. And afterwards I just was never uh, so moved by a movie that I had to run and, and tell everybody, you got to watch that movie. So I'm really the worst person you could ever think about <laughs> asking this question. It is a difficult question, well, you... isn't it? Like, I, I don't think I could name my favorite all-time film. So hard, seriously. My my one is probably, it's actually, it's an old movie, but I only just watched it last year. And it's been my, I think it's just become my favorite. And it's called Come and See. And it's a Russian movie about uh, the Second World War in, in Russia. And uh, it's very brutal um, just to see the impact on the people. It, it's 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 following this one boy and this village that's been taken over by the Nazis and uh, it's it's very and I don't even have words to describe it it's you, you would just have to see it yourself uh, in order to to feel the same brutality that it kind of portrays it's very good. What's the name? Come and see. Come and see. Okay. I've, I've been taking notes for all this entire conversation. You come and see. I can send you. Yeah, yeah. Please, to... please send it. Send it to me afterwards. Yeah. Uh, the names of the stuff that you were recommending, because yeah, I've been. Yeah. I, I'm so uncultured when it comes to cinema. I mean, <laughs> TV and cartoons have had huge impact for me growing up i was i was watching tv like the entire day but i, I was only watching like cartoons i wasn't watching uh, movies on the on, on the tv and tons of them has had a big impact on me on and on the way that i've approached out for sure because uh, i mean during the 90s there was a there was a period of time where so many cartoons were brought over from Japan and then overdubbed and got into, I think Arya Saban was, Saban was the guy who did it. Uh, they were brought into the States and for uh, Israel as well and got overdubbed in Hebrew. And all of them were just super, super weird. And they were all being broadcast in, in the middle of the day. And so some of those have been really stuck with me. So in a way, I... I I grew up on these uh, anime stuff, but very early stuff like eighties and nineties, and I've been so detached from from this genre. So, so when people talk to me about uh, about anime and Japanese uh, animations and movies, I don't I don't know any any of it. Just the stuff that I grew up with. Just the old stuff. I think that's probably some of the best anime as well. Just all the stuff from the eighties and early nineties. I mean, e like, even even like the the brother brothers Grimm tales. I haven't read the the books. I I saw them the, for the first time uh, uh, via anime. <laughs> which ones? Which ones were your favorite? Sorry, I interrupted you though. I, I don't I don't know what mine would be if I'm honest. I'm I'm kind of the same. Like I like watching like you know anime or. Films, I could, just all the films are like, you know, it's, it's either just got to be like something super serious and like really in depth or like something really fun, like, I don't know, Alien or like Rocky. Like, I couldn't oh, get over it. Like Rocky, you never watch Rocky, Larissa, which I find is the most... Ins That's not you true. I've watched You Rocky. told me you've never watched Rocky. That is not true. I watched it with my dad when I was a kid. Most of the movies that I watched as a kid were with my dad because my mum only loves like romance and shit like that. And that just wasn't interesting for me as a kid. So I watched 
all the horror films and Rocky and the Rambo yeah. and Alien and, and Star Wars, all with my dad. I still haven't watched Star Wars. I haven't seen Star Wars. I haven't seen any Star Trek. I haven't seen like tons of stuff that's... Uh... It's really main, mainstream, I don't think it's that uh, but necessary. but even uh, Alien and Aliens, I just saw these couple of movies like a year ago for the first time. Aliens is really good. I really like. Aliens, Aliens. is cool, but it's like, it was more like an action movie than the first one. The first one's the build up, isn't it? And then you yeah. get to the second one, and it's like, oh, it's going down. But uh, but both of them are great. Yeah, I do. I, I way prefer Alien than Predator. Like, I wasn't really into the Predator films as much as Alien. I rewatched what was it? I rewatched Terminator Two even. Yeah, uh, a couple, uh, like a year ago, and it still holds up. Oh, pretty it's, good. I mean, it's an well. amazing film. It's, I haven't watched. Oh, it's so, so good. It, it still does, holds up. Seriously, it, it is. It's incredible. Terminator Two is incredible. I think one of I rewatched. Sorry, no, 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 go, go. I was gonna say that I rewatched uh, all the three Matrix this year as well, and uh, really enjoyed it. Just watching it again because for some reason I didn't really like it when I was a kid. I think I just didn't understand it. Uh, but yeah, it's- I really loved the first one. The first one I saw in in the theater. Second one I saw at home. And I think at some point they started dancing and I was like, oh, I'm done. <laughs> I seriously, I, I stopped and I haven't watched the, the rest of the film. I haven't seen the third one either. <laughs> oh. There's also an anime version of them as well. Yeah, I think of one of I think anime has like a very nostalgic uh, place in my heart. If I, if I get like exposed to today's anime, I think... It's. Uh, I, I think I'm. I'm too. I'm too. Too late in the game for it. <laughs> yeah, I, I just watch documentaries that. right now. Oh, but yeah. seriously, when it comes to like music documentaries, I can watch whatever. I love music docs. Everything, even if I seriously don't care about the music or the artists that are. Uh, here's like an hour and a half about country music. I. I'll see. I just saw it I, on the Netflix one that I have right now. I was like, yeah, five, like 45 minutes about country music. Why not? I'm, I'm, I'm a sucker for, for all of it. Yeah, I love it. it some, I love watching documentaries of musicians and bands that I'm not really familiar with yeah. or don't really like as much. And after I watch documentaries, I'm just like, oh, that person is actually really cool. <laughs> So I'm quite impressionable with music documentaries. Yeah, to be honest with you, it it moves more and more in to like a more positive direction because all of those new documentaries that you have on Netflix and everything, I mean, all of those musicians come out looking like actual, like cool people, like normal down to earth yeah. people that you want to hang out with. And if I compare it to the old stuff that VH1 used to do, it's like, it's horrible. They just would try to find where somebody in the band died or somebody in the band overdosed and whatever and they just would just focus on that or some drama or whatever and they would edit the hell out of those people to come out like as as entertaining as possible i guess and i think today's documentaries are more about showing like the um, humane the human side of these like big stars and everything uh, I've rewatched some kind of monster uh, oh, last week. So it's great. It, it's back on Netflix. So I think that one and the story of Anvil are my two favorite music. I need to rewatch the Anvil one. Yeah. The Anvil one's cool. gold. It's absolute gold. They need to do another one, like number two. Well, I don't think I don't think I don't think they need any more heartache, do they? They've had enough heartache for one band career. Leave it with the one documentary. Is there a Dave Mustaine one? I think that'd be quite interesting. Probably mm. they must be. I mean, I I've read the book. I've read his book, and it's great. I yeah, that's another thing. Like uh, listening to audiobooks, I can listen to any band biography for for 16 hours even if i'm just not a huge fan i mean in the case of megadeth i am a fan but i can uh, rock biographies are also 
something that's yeah i can i can get everything i can totally be, get into everything yeah i've read the the day mustaine one i read the what was it the bruce dickinson one the halford one uh brian slagel's one the ceo of metal blade i can't remember and i and one of the good ones is actually uh shep gordon's uh the um, alice cooper's manager he also wrote a great book i heard that one's supposed to be really good yeah it's a unique character and i mean the further you go back if you if you're listening to stories from like 60s or 70s they're way crazier than tales from the 80s oh i think everything from that era like would be completely unspeakable like <laughs> right now and you get cancelled uh yeah could be but i mean <laughs> The sad part about these books is that the last part of each and every, uh, Tony Iommi's book as well, uh, all of them, the last few uh, chapters are about basically everybody you you meet, you know, dying. I mean, you get everybody gets health problems, everybody gets cancer and die. In all of those books, it's horrible. It's pretty much. So it. yeah, it's also <laughs> like we we had crazy fun at the seventies. 80s, we basically lost all of our money. 90s were weird. 2000s, we are big again and play festivals, but then all of our friends are dead. And now <laughs> I've got this cramp and ache over there. <laughs> yeah, so all of these books are basically on the same, on a, a very similar t- timeline. A story of life. <laughs> yeah. Story of life. <laughs> it's the same now that i'm older yeah i find myself i catch myself uh talking more often about health problems and the weather <laughs> don't we all it happens don't we all? Yeah. <laughs> when the weather conversations creep in on you you're like okay that's that's it <laughs> now move on to the health problems <laughs> i will never be young and interesting ever again <laughs> <laughs> my ba- it, it means you're basically dead but maybe that's a good thing because right now it's just less chance that I will say something that will get me cancelled <laughs> well, just, just stick to weather and health problems <laughs> I, well, seriously we need to go over like all the like Facebook s- stuff we said like 10 years ago and just erase everything make sure we haven't said anything super dumb I, I was PC already back then. I was PC before I was cool to be PC. I think by today's standards, I'm probably not PC enough. It's, it's like a circle. You you can be so PC that at the end, I mean, you can be accused yeah. by the PC people. But I no, I was the, more referring to like saying like stupid stuff <laughs> than uh, than stuff that's not <laughs> politically correct. Yeah. 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 That's what my biggest fear is, is reading the stupid things I said, like, way, last night was great. <laughs> like, you know, when you have those statuses and there's about 20 of them in a row where it's just like, last night was great. Oh, yeah, that's... Actually, because I've, I've been, because you get like these um, on Facebook, that notification where it says, today, so and so many years ago, you posted this. So I've been just like deleting all of them. Exactly. <laughs> Not because you were offensive, you were just less less self aware, I guess. Yeah, I like the ones where you like you have to kind of like dec- like decrypt what the status even means. Like I swear, I had one like it's like twelve years ago, and it was just Star Wars, awesome. <laughs> I'm like, what happened on that day? <laughs> I I used to post like like absolutely stupid shit like mm, I'm having pizza tonight yeah. and you're like oh, okay yeah. it's like why so embarrassing today it needs to be a photo <laughs> yeah. or a series oh. of photos yeah or just some lyrics or something you just post lyrics as a status and you see them like <laughs> yeah. you see them fifteen years later and you're like what song was I listening to. <laughs> yeah for sure yeah yeah but now we just you basically just also don't want to uh 
make the conversation a little bit too too noisy because right now there are so many like eyes and ears on you guys yeah it's, yeah it's yeah be... it's a difficult position isn't it yeah plus it's like uh it blurs the lines between your personal life and your like public life yeah I think that's very important to keep separate as well isn't it like you know The yeah. time my time at home is my time at home you know like I kind of I didn't really post that much about home if I'm honest in fact I don't unless you know there's an event or something I do that's like a change but I don't really you know it's not like I would use Twitter as a you know a platform to explain what I've done every day of my life because that's for me to enjoy you know like that's my day for me to kind of you know, immerse yeah. myself in normal life. <laughs> yeah, I, I, basically, I mean, I uh, signed up for Twitter just to uh, take charge of my name over there, but I never posted anything. But I have like a group of friends on WhatsApp that I know these guys, like a, like a four like good friends that we've been together since maybe like middle school or even maybe like uh, elementary school. And I've been using it as I, t- I told them, I, I've, I use this WhatsApp group as Twitter, as a way to say dumb opinions, but without getting canceled for it. Mm-hmm. I don't, you know, by dumb opinions, I'm not even <laughs> saying like political stuff. I'm just saying like toilet stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So whenever I get like the urge to uh, share my opinion or what happened on the toilet today, I just post it on the on that group in order to <laughs> save myself from becoming a Twitter guy. Yeah. It's, it is, you've got to keep it separate, haven't you? You have to. For sure. Absolutely. For sure. And, and basically, seriously, I truly believe that the, whatever I put out there when it comes to my work is the most uh, interesting thing about me. Everything else is just, I, I, I don't think people should absorb it. <laughs> no, that's that's a great uh, promotional tool a uh, snippet for your um, podcast as well <laughs> tune in today to the guy who's just please okay, <laughs> I think that's that's a good line to to start recording as well, well, that was, well we've, done, yeah. we've done a good one there <laughs> Once again, thank you all for listening and make sure to click follow or subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts or wherever you're getting your podcasts from. And also be sure to check out our merch store www.venomprison.com And as mentioned before, Erebus is up for pre-order now so make sure to get your copy. See you guys soon!